Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode seven of Dissecting the Divine, which is one of my favorite series where we go through God, an anatomy by Francesca Stravracopoulou. I love this book so much. I have learned so much from this book. I know that those of you who are following and watching this, which is a pretty steady group of like five to 7,000 of you are really enjoying this series. And so today we pick up still covering God's genitals. Now, I know you're thinking, what left is there to say? We're going to be talking a lot about circumcision today. We're going to be moving to Jesus as well and talking about his genitals instead of just Yahweh's. And then the fourth chapter in this group is going to be on divine sex. And then we move on to different parts of the body. Part of me wants to feel apologetic and say, I know we're spending a lot of time here. I know it makes some of you uncomfortable. I know it even seems blasphemous to some of you. But the reason there is so much time here is because there is so much material here. Specifically talking about circumcision, it had such a massive impact in the ancient Jewish world. And even when it came to Jesus, it is the first time that he is cut, that this innocent thing or being is going to shed blood. And there's a lot that ties into that. We kick off here again in chapter seven, which is titled Perfecting the Penis. There is a second part in the chapter called Manhood. That's when we're really going to focus on the character of Jesus Christ. And she opens with a story about an artist, specifically of the 1990s, Jeff Kuhn. Some of you may know of him. He did a series of illustrations called Made in Heaven, and people were quite upset about it. Not because just of the graphic nature of them, but specifically because of the graphic nature of these religious scenes, like Adam and Eve, for example. One thing we have found is abundantly clear in modern Christianity is a skittishness when it comes to mixing religion and sex in any capacity. So she uses this to kind of set the stage of I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's not what we typically think of when we think of the Bible and this God, but that's only because of the centuries of redactions and edits and reframing and refocusing on what was originally a major part of the story. We know that Abraham is the first recorded man to be circumcised, and it allows him to walk with God, and we're going to talk quite a bit about that part of the story here, but it leaves people to wonder, what about Noah? He was righteous, and it seems like it requires circumcision to be righteous, and again, Adam was made in God's image. Was Adam circumcised? We have good reason to believe that Yahweh himself is circumcised, which we will get into, and so she covers kind of the theological debate that has been going on for millennia at this point over if this God and Adam and Noah are indeed circumcised. She then references the Ugaritic myth of Ael being circumcised himself, which allows him to become even more fruitful as he then goes and makes children with two women. This is the myth of the budding vine being pruned and clipped back to allow for its true growth and potential and potency. This metaphor is all over the ancient world and specifically the scriptures. And we'll be making that connection and comparison a few times in our discussion today. In fact, even from a New Testament perspective, we have verses in John talking about how Jesus is the true vine who is pruned by the Father to increase his spiritual potency, if you will. Then we have the Phoenician myth, also about Ael circumcising himself this time. Right before he sacrifices his son, Yiddish, I think is the name, which means beloved. Does that sound familiar? We see a lot of allusions with this when we get to Abraham, who becomes circumcised to walk with God and then is required, theoretically, to sacrifice his son, Isaac. She then gets into the history of circumcision and covers where it was popular, when it wasn't popular, some of what the historians like Herodotus talked about it, but it was kind of satirical, making fun almost of the Egyptians for doing so. It was was definitely a well-known practice, but it was not practiced by everyone. It would really take off specifically with the Jewish tradition. Circumcision here appears to function as a body ritual, manifesting a new social identity or religious status, enabling the circumcised to perform particular roles otherwise unavailable to them. Indeed, male circumcision in ancient or traditional societies tends to function in this way. Like other forms of religious body modification, including piercing, tattooing, scarification, and cutting, 
cutting, male circumcision is a means of making the body. In contrast to the notion of the natural body as a body unchanged and unadorned, the people of ancient Southwest Asia and Egypt perceived the body as an unfinished, ongoing social project, subject to essential alteration, adjustment, and reformation. So again, just gives some historical background and context about what was going on and how the people viewed it. She goes on to explain that in the West, we kind of justify it today, even in a non-Christian setting as a cleanliness issue, but that this was not the reason at all, and that it was not just this medical thing, that this was a way to become whole, to become as manly as possible. You're pruning it back. You're essentially, her words here, opening the penis, allowing for the full potency of this member. She compares it to other parts of the body that might not be working as well in other conditions like deaf ears or a muted mouth. In the Bible, it even alludes to these things as uncircumcised body parts, meaning that the circumcised body part is itself in its highest, most powerful form. This was socially, politically, and religiously important, and without it, you were those things impotent. What does that say for women and eunuchs? It says less of them, or any man that had functional issues or castration, etc. Eunuchs were slightly higher up the chain because they were closer to the idealized male version, and then women were even further down the chain. So she covers a lot of time on both sections, and I'm going to let you read about eunuchs on your own, but I'll share some of what she covers here about women because I think that it is very interesting and highly problematic for how long-lasting the effects of not just this religion and this culture, but so many ancient religions and cultures have always denigrated women. And again, the effect that that has and still has in viewing women as often second-class citizens in many times and places around the world. For instance, women were strictly excluded from the temple. Like, what a crazy thing. This is back in the day where this is where Yahweh resides. This is his home. This is how he interacts. Women could not be in the priesthood. They could not come before the presence of the Lord. They were missing this symbol of God's perfect power. If you think back to chapter 6 and what we talked about, the virility, the weaponry of the male penis and God's penis in particular, those who didn't even have the chance or capacity to own such power were simply out of luck. We know that so many things about being a woman made you unclean, whether it was discharged or menstruation, or even giving birth, supposedly what they are put here for. We read in the New Testament that it is by being fruitful that women become righteous, and yet here we see that it makes them unclean. In fact, even when they had a baby boy, it made them unclean. However, as soon as the boy on day eight was circumcised, the blood from his circumcision seemed to counteract the uncleanliness that he was still in his mother's bodily fluids and made him clean, but the mother remained unclean for another 33 days. Now, if the mother had a female daughter, they were both unclean, and the ritual period before they could become clean again lasted even longer at 66 days after the initial two-week period. And of course, these concepts carried over into sexist ideas about a woman's place and her value and her worth. It seems like an all-powerful God would not be this hung up on the power of the blood from circumcision circumcision, being able to make one gender cleaner than the other, and thus able to enter into his presence, etc. Like, it's truly stupid. I understand from a cultural perspective how it evolved and why it happened, etc. But if we're really trying to believe that this is real, that this God cared about these things and set up these standards and rules, which are all laid out in mainly Leviticus, by the way, and the fallout from this particular care is so horrendous that it makes it very inexcusable for God. So there's a lot more about women, but I want to read you kind of the ending paragraph before we transition into the second part here. At the apex of this hierarchy was the circumcised male body, a body itself drawn on a divine paradigm, the body of God. As the cosmic creator who constructed human males in his own image, it was for many beyond theological doubt that God himself was circumcised and that this form of body modification among his male worshippers perfected their own penises, making their bodies whole, unblemished, and divinely fertile, as it had 
Abraham. I think that is a really good summary to the importance that he placed on the penis. This isn't just some silly word to God. This is the representation of himself, of his power. He's a creation God. This is his fertility. So let's move on to part two in this chapter, which is titled Manhood. She starts off by explaining to us that for all the obsession over Jesus, we have zero physical descriptions of Jesus except for two things. One, his body at the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection. But before that, the only other description we get at all is that the gospel writer is very clear to make sure we know Jesus was indeed circumcised. From there, we don't get what you would typically see with the circumcised perfect male. We do not have a Jesus either in human form or in spiritual form that is fruitful in the way that we typically think of it and the way that this typically led to. Jesus Christ is childless. In Instead, his fruitfulness seems to be that of a spiritual fruitfulness. Let me read you this. In the letter to the Colossians, Christ's circumcision figuratively defleshes the base bodies of his followers, transforming them into spiritually charged believers destined for eternal life. In him also were you circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. I think that's so interesting. You might think of the New Testament getting away from all this barbaricness of the Old Testament. No, we just spiritualize it. This is so common, we see it in everything. Paul is mainly to think for a lot of this. It seems interesting because there's this reversal, this idea within the Christian communities at the time that they didn't want to be bound by these old ideas of Jewish tradition. And a lot of this has to just be because of the popularity of the Greco-Roman world around them. At this time, the Greco-Roman ideal of the perfect male was the uncircumcised penis. And we saw people re-circumcising themselves. There were two methods. One was a sheath of sorts, which you can probably imagine. And the second was to hang weights on the remaining flesh to let it pull back down. So again, in the Greco-Roman world, not only did we have this standard for what the ideal male should be, but we also had the negative connotation with those that were circumcised, that that individual was barbaric, that they were out of control in their sexual appetites. And so you can see why people of the day who identified in that world, yet were converting to Christianity, did not want to become circumcised as was the Jewish tradition. And so this is one of the first times that we kind of see this distinction between Old Testament and New Testament, between Jewish tradition and the, at that time, modern Christianity. And that's a lot of what is getting fleshed out, pardon the pun, by Paul and some of the other New Testament writers as they develop the new church and they're putting out these new rules. But he does go on to give express permission to be who you are in regards to circumcision and to not make it a mandatory thing, that this has died with Jesus's resurrection. And a big part of the reasoning is that Like Jesus, Paul expected the end at any time. Why be concerned with our physical bodies when we're this close to getting new spiritual bodies? This wrongful concept that the end is almost here really did change the way these people were thinking about this religion for the first time in a long time, at least in terms of Jewish tradition. The last part of section two here gets into a ton of of church history, leading all the way up to the modern Vatican. And I think that it's an important part to go and read for yourself again, because so many times we hear about how silly Protestantism is and that we have all of these things that happened after Luther and, you know, the church tradition and church fathers and church teaching and all these things. This is what was real. This is what mattered. They had an idea of what was going on. They were more consistent. And when it comes to even a subject like what happened to Christ's foreskin, you see all all of the different ideas that people had about this being a spiritual relic that could give you actual powers and that it could repopulate itself so people were eating it and sharing it. And it's insane, honestly, 
to read through this and see just how bananas people were about what would be called the Holy Pupus. And one of the first stories that comes is from an Arabic infancy gospel, which is obviously not considered canon, but it talks about a midwife that was there at the birth and the circumcision of Jesus that was able to hold on to part of his foreskin, put it in oil, and kept it. And guess where it shows up just for a bit of fun fan fiction mixing into the rest of the canon? It shows up for the woman who is using oil and her hair to bathe and massage Jesus's feet. So comes full circle there. But even after that, so many different churches and priests and popes claimed to possess it. And whenever there was contention that, well, this church says they have it and this church says they have it, it was just said, yeah, no matter if we destroy it, consume it, break it, there's always going to be more, this regenerative power. The most famous example is that Charlemagne receives it from a heavenly hand that comes down and gives it to him, but he trades it essentially for being recognized by Pope Leo III. Some believe it was just lost, others that it was snatched by dark forces at the Vatican. There's more details here than you would care to know. There's a lot of the women who come into contact with this that see it as a sensual object. After all, they are the bride of Christ. A famous example of this is Catherine of Siena, who had a vision that she was married to Jesus and that his foreskin wrapped around her ring finger to provide a wedding band. She and many others also reported tasting the divine flesh of Christ and having orgasmic and out-of-body, very sensual and erotic experiences because of it. So again, we are seeing Christ's sexual prowess that typically we don't think of lasting even after death in just the form of his flaccid and spliced penis skin. So why all the craze? Why was this so important? Well, again, you have to remember this is a cult that uses and believes in blood magic. From the very beginning with the sacrifices Yahweh demands in the Old Testament, all of the ritual cleansing and cleaning that happens in blood, the blood of Jesus being the extension of this, and again, the very first time that Jesus spills blood that he is cut is at his circumcision. So she ends by showing us examples of how people conceptualized of Jesus and his circumcision through the art, through the ages. So it starts off with some of this medieval art showing Jesus being circumcised early on by men, Jewish men, but depicting Jesus as a wider fat baby. So kind of this anti-Semitic idea again about how the Jews have come to harm the innocent Christ that is more like them. And then we get the Madonna and child, which is Mary holding the child and sometimes covering his genitals and then kind of an evolution of her literally kind of fondling or playing or holding the genitals between her fingers. And there's a whole diatribe there all the way up to the Pieta, where we have a full-grown Jesus after his crucifixion across Mother Mary's lap. And in many of these cases, he has an erection. And it is almost as if, again, the power of this God is in his penis, and even in death, his erection points to the fact that he is still living and ties into the resurrection of raising from the dead. Lots of imagery and symbolism and just a very unique concept. I know it's so hard for us to see that in Jesus when so many of us were raised with this very different, docile, sexless, more eunuch-like Christ than anything else, but that is just not par for the course of who this God is in any of his Trinitarian forms. So let me end by reading the last paragraph here in this chapter. Speaking on what I just covered, she says, it is a profoundly theological image, single and celibate, asexual and child-free. In the text-centric modern West, we have become so accustomed to the neutered Christ of the New Testament that it is difficult to comprehend or even perceive the veneration of the sexualized virility of this divine men within those societies preceding our own. But across the visual cultures of late antique, medieval, and Renaissance Europe, 
close attention to Christ's genitals in legends, relics, icons, and artwork served not only to highlight his maleness and his humanity, but his death-defying divine virility. Whether newly circumcised, prepubescent, or maturely erect, the divine penis of the post-biblical Christ inherited the sexualized, life-giving agency of the phallic body of the God of the Bible, with one important exception. In the religious imagination, Christ tended to remain tantalizingly chaste and sexually innocent. The God of the Bible did not, which will lead us perfectly into the next chapter, chapter 8, Divine Sex. And I think many of you will be shocked by what is in our own Bible about that particular topic. So I hope that you learned something. I think this is fascinating. Again, once you get past the more silly nature of what we are talking about, there is so much to see and learn about this religion and its history and this culture and their concepts and how it leaked into so many different theological ideas that Christians still maintain today. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Tomorrow I will have another Sunday video for you that I am excited about, so stay tuned for that. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you simply enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.